This is the CBS Evening News, Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. It is Friday morning in Beijing. Signs indicate China's old line communist hardliners are consolidating their control behind loyal tanks and guns. The threat of outright civil war, army against army, may be subsiding, at least for now. The apparent architect of the Beijing massacre, hardline premier Li Peng, surfaced to praise those military units that did his bidding. He ordered the protest leaders to surrender or be tracked down wherever they go. Key student leaders reportedly already are being rounded up, quietly out of sight. More on these and other developments from our China correspondent, John Shea. Martial law authorities seem to have defused the urban guerrilla war by removing much of the 27th Army, the troops blamed for most of the killing at Tiananmen Square. They were replaced by less hostile soldiers who draw fewer attacks from the people. The city is in a state of uneasy calm, still surrounded by strong rival armies. They could go either way. It could either, it could either stabilize or it could get worse. Troops have been clearing away the wreckage of the battles to make way for normal traffic. Civilian police are gradually reappearing, a strong indication that the government is reasserting control. Prime Minister Li Peng appeared on the television news for the first time in a week, a sign that the hardliners who ordered the bloody repression are holding the reins. And they're furious with the U.S. Embassy for sheltering China's most famous dissident, Fang Li Zhe. Professor Fang is an outspoken critic of the communist system. Though he had no direct involvement with the student demonstrations for democracy, communist authorities blamed him. He was burned in effigy last week at a government-orchestrated rally. Then Washington blew his cover by announcing that he is in the American mission. Where is Professor Fong now? I can't comment on that. The State Department is saying that he's in the U.S. Embassy. That's the State Department's business. If they have all the answers, ask them. Both Fong and the U.S. are trapped. Now, if he tries to leave the embassy, he will very likely be arrested. Arrests are mounting, and the list of people to be rounded up is long. Student leaders and pro-democracy labor leaders have also gone into hiding. The government today ordered them to turn themselves in or face even more severe punishment when they are captured. John Shayan, CBS News, Beijing. If the overall impression is one of calm, there are still at least isolated moments of sheer terror. Three members of a BBC camera crew were filming near a burned-out tank in eastern Beijing when it happened to them. The BBC reporter Brian Barron describes what happened. Suddenly, about six policemen assaulted us. Half of them were plainclothes men, secret policemen. Everyone was armed to the teeth. They had loaded pistols, which were cocked. There were two unpleasant minutes while we knelt in the road. One of the secret policemen put his loaded revolver against the temple of our sound recordist. The others were cursing and threatening us and brandishing their guns. After that harrowing experience, the men were held briefly and then released. The guns of June are firing less, killing fewer now. China's leaders are beginning to use another old and favored weapon of dictatorial regimes, one that over time tries to make you believe what you know to be false and doubt what you know to be true. Bob Simon in Beijing details how China's rulers are reasserting the straight party line trying to kill the spirit of the resistance. The People's Army was out helping the people again today, giving old ladies first aid, sweeping away debris and disorder. Officers said they were restoring normality and ridding the city of ruffians. Men on the street said people are happy now because their soldiers have taken charge. That was the message on China's TV news tonight, which also broadcast gruesome footage of soldiers who'd been burned alive in the battle for Tiananmen Square. There was another version of what happened that blood-soaked night. Those underground mimeographed wall posters were being read and copied and believed by people often afraid to have their pictures taken. Say, what is the truth from Tiananmen Square? It just said, kill a lot of people. Killed a lot of people. Do you believe that? Yeah, I believe so. Students brought their evidence of the army's butchery to CBS News in Beijing today, still photographs of their fallen comrades, pictures which will never be broadcast in China. The government clearly has the edge in this battle of the truth waves. Ultimately, paving stones can't beat tanks. Posters and photos can't beat television.
The army is kept to the main boulevards pretty much. Soldiers have not come into the small streets, the old byways of Beijing. But these are not the same places they were last week. There's still anger, there's still defiance, but it's muted now. It's as if people have put on masks again. They can no longer afford to demonstrate what they really feel. The same people who greeted journalists with cheers and applause last week are now full of resentment and fear. Just stop that fooling, okay? Please. Why? Why? Because, you know, the traffic, the traffic, we can't go through. Of course you can. The road's open. No, no, no. There are many cars, bicycles. I don't see any cars. You don't see any cars. Where are the cars? Please. It's bad. You're not supposed to be here. Leave, says a woman. The government has now accused the United States and Hong Kong of masterminding the rebellion. It's dangerous to be seen with Americans. Come with me, give me your film, says a local cadre. We escaped by surrendering a cassette which was blank. There are still glimmers of the heroism that thrilled the world, offerings for the Westerners who are still around. A mile from Tiananmen Square, people gathered with reverence by the statue of a dancing girl with garlands of bullet holes and flowers, a monument to the massacre. Other monuments stand nearby, burned out buses littering the boulevard like shipwrecks skirted by a sea of bicycles, Beijing's barometer of normalcy. When the People's Army came by, people scattered as soldiers chased us away with automatic weapons. In today's communist China, it's not just power that comes from the barrel of a gun, it's the source of truth as well. Bob Simon, CBS News, Beijing. The first U.S. chartered airliner left Beijing today carrying hundreds of embassy dependents and some other Americans to safety. While they were grateful, other Americans found little to praise in their government's efforts to help them, as we hear from Bill Whitaker. It's the kind of Beijing. The exodus of Americans and other foreigners also continues from China's largest city, Shanghai, where the pro-democracy movement still breathes, still has some life. But Jerry Bowen reports the lesson of Beijing shows how quickly that could all change. In the port city of Shanghai, China's largest urban area with a population of 12 million, it's been so strangely quiet the last 24 hours that even resident diplomatic sources will tell you they don't know what's going on, much less what's likely to happen. Shops have stayed open here, and there have been gradually more buses on the streets. But the protest continues. Half the workers are boycotting, staying off the job despite government warnings. And students are still blockading intersections, though there seem to be fewer barricades in the city. And like their colleagues in Beijing, they have demands. Yeah. Uh, want the, the, democracy. <clears throat> the Shanghai students even have their own styrofoam statue of liberty and a steady supply of newspapers from Hong Kong, some in English, to learn the latest from Beijing. But unlike Beijing, there's no military presence here. Even the guards at the People's Congress building maintain a low profile. And Shanghai's main square has scores of bicycles, not one tank. Still, the burning of a train by protesters in the city earlier this week was enough to put foreign consulates on alert and foreign nationals here on the list for evacuation. U.S. citizens going on the United Airlines charter flight to Narita Tokyo Airport. More than 400 evacuees from a half dozen countries waited for the charter flights today. Students, tourists, and diplomatic dependents feeling more sad than fearful. Okay, so we're wondering if it wasn't um, premature to be leaving now, but um, things seem to be changing so quickly. We're sad to leave, and we hope that that the situation will get better so that we will be able to come back. And so the contrast in China continue. Foreigners fleeing Beijing because they know what can happen. Westerners leaving Shanghai because of concerns more than fears that something may happen here, too. Jerry Bowen, CBS News, Shanghai. Still to come on the CBS Evening News, Susan Spencer on Dr. Salk and the prospect of a possible AIDS vaccine. David Dow on a prisoner due out soon and an actress who fears for her life. And James Satori has pictures of a tornado that shredded power lines and raped Louisiana. Progress in the war against AIDS must always be hedged with cautionary phrases about the need for further research and testing. That said, a doctor who has already written medical history today made a claim that excited attention at the International AIDS Conference in Montreal 
CBS News medical correspondent Susan Spencer is there. A flicker of good news today. A report from Dr. Jonas Salk, developer of the polio vaccine, that an AIDS vaccine he's testing in chimps appears to rid them of the virus. It suggests that it may be possible uh, to vaccinate against infection. Dr. Salk's vaccine so far has worked in only two animals, and trials in humans haven't yet proven successful. But other researchers were nonetheless very interested. They are beginnings of, of progress that we did not have a year ago. Much more work will have to be done to know what, if anything, this all really means. But the news, at least temporarily, rescued this conference from what many scientists here feel has become a largely political event. Prostitutes top today's scheduled demonstrations, joining this week people with AIDS, gay rights activists, and lesbians in demanding their voices also be heard, shouting down speakers, asking uncomfortable questions. It doesn't attract if they're outside the hall. The problem is that they're not, they're inside, and it disrupts the scientific meetings. But others said it may be healthy for scientists to have to confront social questions, questions of discrimination, costs, ethics. Healthy, too, to have to confront those people most directly affected by their work. That's what makes this conference what it is. It's, it's the life force of this conference. You can't cut that off. You can't let it split. Upset researchers could at least take heart from the research. Among the more interesting drugs in testing, Compound Q, an extract from a Chinese cucumber. Erythropoietin, a drug just approved last week to overcome some of the side effects of AZT. And CD4s, molecules designed by computer to interfere with the virus when it attacks cells. I would hope that within the next five years we would be able to achieve a five-year lifespan. But the good news isn't good enough for those who demonstrated this week. It's quite clear now that the tension between scientists struggling to find the answers and those who most need them is a permanent aspect of AIDS. Susan Spencer, CBS News, Montreal. A Soviet MiG-29 pilot doing fancy flying maneuvers for the Paris Air Show finished up with a bang today. Engine failure and a spectacular unplanned bailout just seconds before his fighter jet crashed in flames. Amazingly, the Soviet pilot survived. He was so close to the ground when he ejected that his parachute had barely started to open. Months linked to most major tornadoes in this country are April, May, and June. And on this date in 1953, more than 110 people died in tornadoes that hit Michigan and Ohio. Tornadoes rolling through the Great Plains and upper Midwest just five years ago today killed at least 16 people. And today, a killer tornado hit a small town in Louisiana. James Satori has the amazing pictures. Everybody inside! Everybody inside! Home video cameras capture dramatic pictures, but don't convey the full fury of tornadoes which struck southern Louisiana this morning. I looked out again and I saw trees and everything just flying. I said, oh my God, a storm. A twister flattened trailer homes and businesses across a square mile in the small town of Gross Tate, leaving at least two people dead, hundreds more homeless. The thing I knew I was out in the backyard. And she was on the, her and my mom was underneath the trailer. I've heard people say it sound like a freight train or a locomotive, but this didn't have anything to do with a locomotive. It sounded like a jet sitting on top of the roof. The tornado toppled 75-foot trees, adding to the debris which covered roads and yards. Police used search dogs to look for victims. And this area by this telegram pole was my wife and two and baby girls. Now, they were trapped under that, under that debris over there. Louisiana is the latest state hit by a violent storm system which swept the south this week, leaving flooded homes and devastation in its wake. Late this afternoon, Louisiana Governor Buddy Romer surveyed the damage. He's calling in the National Guard and will ask for federal disaster relief. Tornadoes are unusual in southern Louisiana, and today's caught forecasters off guard, striking just after the Weather Service lifted a severe storm warning. James Hattori, CBS News, Gross Tate, Louisiana. Which said she felt, quote, like I'm in a nightmare. She was not talking about a movie or television role. The man who nearly killed her seven years ago is still obsessed with her, and what is called his good behavior parole date is just a week from today. David Dow picks up the story. 
For actress Teresa Saldana, expecting her first baby, these are days of preparing for new life and battling to protect her own. How does one pursue happiness when you're aware of such an ominous threat hanging over your head? The threat, as Saldana sees it, comes from Vacaville State Prison, from Arthur Jackson, a Scottish drifter convicted of nearly killing her in 1982. Are you Teresa Saldana? The brutal knife attack and Saldana's rescue by a deliveryman were portrayed in a movie starring the victim herself. Jackson was sentenced to 12 years, a man obsessed with Saldana, craving, he said, to be united with her in heaven. I would say the forces of darkness intervened and sabotaged the goodness, the virtue of that mission. But under California law, Jackson is eligible for release next week after seven years, despite his letters from prison. Even as recently as March of last year, he wrote that if he couldn't kill Teresa, he would use others outside of prison to kill her. Yesterday, Jackson told his attorney another story. He told me that he had no intention of harming her or anybody else. We consider that he is uh, severely um, uh, emotionally disturbed. Saldana and friends have battled to keep Jackson in prison, only to be told repeatedly there was no legal remedy. Now is the time that something can be done to keep him in. And once he's released, it will be too late. Either I'll live a life totally in fear, or he will kill me. Finally, today, some hope for Saldana. New charges were filed against Jackson of threatening a victim, charges that could result in nearly eight more years in prison. Our objective, quite simply, is to keep him off the street for as long as possible. Even if that fails, Jackson could face deportation to England to confront charges of a murder he's confessed to in prison. David Dow, CBS News, Los Angeles. The Federal Aviation Administration announced more than $1.2 million in fines today against 28 airlines. The fines imposed for lapses in airport security. You're looking at one Advil. In just one Advil tablet, there's the effectiveness of two regular aspirin or two regular strength Tylenol. But when you really hurt and need more relief, two Advil may quick work of the pain. Yet for all its effectiveness, Advil is still gentler to your stomach than aspirin. Before, there was only aspirin or Tylenol. But today, there's Advil. Advil, tablets and caplets, advanced medicine for pain. Have you read about the Surgeon General's report? Oh, I'll get to it right after my grape nuts. It says Americans should be eating more complex carbohydrates. Uh, can you make that simple? They're energy sustaining, so they help you get through the morning. And grape nuts is loaded with them. So while I'm enjoying this great nutty taste, I get those complex... Complex carbohydrates to help you get through the morning. Oh. Who would have thought these little things could do so much? Who? Post Grape Nut Cereal, the one and only. Now it eats these things, all right? It opens its mouth, and in it goes. Peter, no TV till you've had your breakfast. Now it eats these things, all right? Peter! Well, don't worry, Mr. Bowen, you're covered. Thank you. It's automatic when you use the American Express card. Lost, stolen, or damaged, a way to protect the things you buy. Children accidentally shooting children. We reported last night on that tragedy of our times, but it is a story without end. Today in Florida, another chapter written in blood and sorrowing, angry parents who are trying to fight back. Bruce Hall reports. Four-year-old Evie Sue Hagen is in serious condition tonight, fighting for her life in an Orlando hospital. Another victim of kids playing with handguns. Her six-year-old brother, David, dropped a loaded gun, and it fired, hitting Evie Sue in the neck and jaw. It is the third tragic case of children shooting children this week in Florida. 13-year-old Barry McDonald believed his stepfather's gun was not loaded when he pointed it at best friend Scott Feltner and pulled the trigger. It was. Feltner's parents are so distraught, they invited other parents to come to the funeral home tonight so they can understand what happens when kids play with guns. 
You all out there can't afford a three dollar lock for your gun, I'll buy you one. And that's the way I feel about it. I will buy you one. Because this could have all been prevented. People lock their cars when they go to the shopping center. Why can't they lock their guns up when they go to work? I don't think I'll ever stop listening. He's my baby. John Darling knows the pain these parents are going through. Three years ago, he lost a child in a shooting accident and is devoting his life to gun safety. I think it's time for the American people to, to show their emotions that we need to do something about the problem of our children being killed. He believes one thing that will help his parents hearing the anguish in the voice of 10-year-old Sean Smith when he called the emergency number 911 this week to say he had shot his sister. I didn't know my dad was, my dad's gun was loaded and, okay. and, I, and I shot her. Okay. I didn't mean to. Okay. Last year, nearly 3,000 children shot other youngsters most with guns owned by their parents, most during summer vacations when adults are at work. Deborah Lungsford says you can tell children over and over, guns are dangerous, but now she knows that is not enough. You can't take an eight-year-old and a nine-year-old and put them in a room with a couple loaded guns and think that they're not gonna play with them because they are, they're gonna see how they work. Her son, Jason, was shot and killed last night by a friend. They were just playing too. Bruce Hall, CBS News, Atlanta. And that's tonight's CBS Evening News. We'll continue to keep you informed of major developments in China on this CBS station. And at 8 tonight, Eastern Time, 7 Central, we'll be back with President Bush's news conference about China and other issues. Dan Rather, stay tuned. We'll see you here again soon. Smith. Tomorrow, reaction to the president's news conference. Also, Texas politician Ann Richards and new college grad Harry Reasoner. Tomorrow on CBS This Morning. This is CBS.